Well, that was our prayer for the message. And since we sang a couple of slow songs, I think I have to act out something in a moment. First, let me wish you a happy new year. But I want to misquote a famous misquote. And if you're sharp, you'll go home and figure this out. Houghton, we have a problem. <laughs> Study it. It actually was misquoted in the movie. Maybe you remember exactly a year ago on this Sunday, uh, we shared the relief that the disease, division, disaster, disappointment, riddle 2020 was over. We anticipated things getting better in 2021, correct? Then 2021 hit like a ton of bricks in a lot of ways. So I think we're probably just a little less uh, optimistic right now as we start 2022, thinking it's going to be more of the same. And we just have to kind of press on, slog ahead like a marathoner running out of gas. I was going to draw cartoons, but I ran out of time. I've been looking at Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, especially chapter 3, which we heard part of. And he also says we have a problem. In verse 2, he says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, and so on. And in verse 18 of chapter 3, and by the way, we'll be in chapter 3, so there are Bibles in front of you if you want to open up to them. It's... Uh, it might be a help. Uh, 18, he says, I have often told you before and now tell you again, you heard this, with tears. This chapter has a lot of passion and personality in it. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Sounds a lot like conversations I've heard from people describing the world we live in today, doesn't it? But wait, <laughs> there's more in this chapter. The chapter actually begins in verse 1. My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. We can actually enter 2022 with all its potential disappointments and challenges with joy. And this chapter lets us in on the reason. And it's a Sunday school reason. So you all ought to get it when I give you the chance. The reason is Jesus. Hey, you did much better than the outdoor people, but they were out there frozen to death, so I guess that's why. The reason is Jesus. He has plans for us. What a letter the book of Philippians is. The word joy or rejoicing is used at least a dozen times in this letter. This is in spite that the Christians of Philippi were living in a pluralistic pagan city under the political thumb of Rome. They were a colony, and we complain. Paul's situation was no better than ours. Uh, actually, it was worse. As I told the crowd outside, they were a little bit cold, but Paul was writing under house arrest, falsely accused, misrepresented and misunderstood, likely tethered to a Roman guard and facing a stressful trial, possibly death. You'd think he'd be down in the dumps. <laughs> but instead, this letter is one of the most positive in the whole Bible. So he tells those recent citizens of heaven, church pillar Lydia, the freed slave Greek girl who he delivered from demon possession, the Philippian jailer and his family, the other members of the little nucleus of a new church, rejoice and press on. And I don't think it was this kind of press on that he had in mind. This particular chapter, chapter 3, Paul gets, as I said, personal. He talks about his past, his present, and his future. Verses 1 to 11, which we didn't read, were all about his high pedigree and zealous works and that they proved worthless compared to knowing Christ through faith. I want to read just some portions of verse 8 and verses 10 and 11, which we didn't hear before. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. 
Or, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. Is that what we want? <laughs> Let that sink in. Next, Paul, in the next section, is realistic about his present situation, verses 12 to 16, where he admits that he hasn't arrived yet, but he makes the prize of knowing Christ his main goal and passion in life. And then the last section, which to me has a lot of meaning, he looks at his future, verses 17 to 21, where as a heavenly citizen, Earthly trials and trinkets fade compared to life in Christ, which will be transformed forever. That gives Paul, and it ought to give us, a lot of reason to be extremely joyful this first day, second, first Sunday of the new year. Now, there are kind of two sides to this I want to bring out. First, if you're going to successfully live in the present and face the future, I know it in here a couple things we have to let go of. First, our past accomplishments. Verse 13, forgetting what is behind. Reaching our prize, Jesus, does not depend on how great we've been or about our good works. Now, I could rattle off a few things about me. Some people have accused me of bleeding purple and gold. I was born in Fillmore Hospital. Yes, right near Philippi's garage. And uh, I was raised in those first days in the little white house next to the dentist office. And, uh, you know, I was graduated from Houghton College in 1969, who's whatever they call that. And I was on the first team, my picture is on the K-Pak wall. And uh, I was the son of a preacher and the son of a great artist. And uh, I was a missionary. How high can you go? I mean, my list of accomplishments, but I, I really kind of don't like it when people say, oh, this, this is somebody who's just true blue Houghton. You know, I mean, it's a little bit embarrassing. I could go on and on, blah, 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 but you know what? It's useless. It's worthless compared to knowing Christ. I'm deeply thankful, however, for my upbringing in a Christ-centered, God-honoring home with its flaws and all. I met Jesus there. The fact is, some people actually have turned their backs on that kind of upbringing, and that's sad. But the fact is, the joy of my salvation is not based on my past or my upbringing or my works at all. It's based on Jesus Christ. So let go of those things. And a question for you, young and old, do you know Jesus? Or are you banking on your good resume or your good works? There's no joy in that. Find the joy of Jesus, and he's looking for you. And the second thing I think we need to let go of is to dwell on these, this world's problems and attractions. He says in verse 19, their mind is set on earthly things. Our prize, Jesus, outweighs everything in this world we mustn't get too enamored with the stuff of this world. Talked about it in one of the songs I think we sang today. We have our love of our real and our imaginary heroes and make such a big deal of them. We're tempted to lean on our possessions, our pleasures, entertainment. And we're even sometimes overworked with our work, our, our occupations. And these things can drown out Jesus. All our energy can be sucked up in the cares of this world. Watch out. And we mustn't get dragged down also by the problems of our world, which is what's, I think, on our minds today. Many Christians are into saying the world, are into saving the world from its evils. And it's so easy to actually neglect Jesus in this world trying to save the world. I believe for some, Christianity has become about our agendas and our causes, some good, some dubious, leaving Jesus and his kingdom out and in the dust. 
And seeing this, some folks sadly have found the church hollow and stripped of the presence of the reality of Christ. Are we too focused on our, jo- our toys and our troubles? There's no joy there. And now I've got to let the Holy Spirit talk to you about those things. But I want to add something quickly on this idea of our citizen being in this world and in heaven. Can we live and have purpose in this world while being citizens of the next world? I like the definition one commentary says, where Christ is, is our mother country and our fatherland. It's a good definition of our citizenship is in heaven. That's where he is. Of course, he's in our hearts too. But we could be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. Our college founder was all about fixing up the world. And so that kind of gives us a clue. And our church's roots were deep in righting the wrongs of the world. Christians have and are making a difference in the world and should. I was talking to Bill Duzema, a historian just before service and we think of the 18th century evangelical revival in England and, and other revivals. When people are concerned about holiness and spiritual things and Christ and heaven, and yet out of those revivals come some of the great societal changes, child labor laws, uh, anti-slavery, abolishing slavery. Christians who really know Jesus roll up their sleeves and change the world. With the gospel has come medicine and education and the Bible translation in their languages around the world. I always love the fact that a friend of mine that I've sat under his feet, Dr. Lamine Sana of Yale University, a great West African, former Muslim, had said that the missionary movement in West Africa, translating the Bible into their language, was what actually freed the people to put off colonialism. Yes, Christians make a difference in this world. Why? Because Jesus said, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, when you feed the hungry, water the thirsty, invite the alien and the stranger, clothe the naked and visit the sick and visit those in prison, you're doing it for me. You've done it for me. So what about also the good things of life? Because that's some of the problems. But what about nature and science and art and music and adventure and service. Are we to enjoy life in this world or live in a cocoon waiting for the next? What do you think? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, but then these things will be added to you. He prayed for his disciples to be in the world, but not of it. So knowing Jesus makes a difference with this problem or this issue of we are citizens of heaven and citizens of this world and I said it's I'd say it's a pretty good a lifetime project of yours to figure this out but I love an old hymn written by George Robinson in 1890 heaven above is softer blue earth around is sweeter green something lives in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen birds with gladder songs or flow, flowers with deeper beauties shine, Zinnius. Since I know, as now I know, I am his and he is mine. Christians probably enjoy life more or ought to than anyone else because they know Jesus. And we all know C.S. Lewis's famous thoughts, aim for heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim for earth, and you get neither. I think one of my favorite examples of this is Eric Liddell, the 1928 Olympic champion, who had a call to missions, and yet he was just struggling. His sister was struggling that he liked to run. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, yes, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. When you push, when push comes to some, uh, comes to shove in his life after his going to China as a missionary, he was interned in a, a prison camp along with others, Westerners and so on, Europeans, and there he poured his life out till he died in camp, helping young people, sharing his love of Christ with them through games and sports and teaching science. 
Yes, he enjoyed life, but he was also very well, aware well of Christ giving him his joy. So those are some things and thoughts about what well, you have to lay off or leave off, but there's more to this chapter, of course. What are we supposed to embrace? We focus on the apostles' main point here. If we are going to successfully navigate 2022 and beyond, we must joyfully and confidently press on towards Christ. Press on to take hold, he says. Press on toward the prize. And I look at this as not a runner in his last gasping breath in a marathon, but rather a runner full of second wind going towards the finish line and finishing well. There are several fascinating keys to this, and I think of it as kind of three couplets of threes, so I'm going to quickly mention them. Press on. It's used three times in this chapter. The first one we don't quite see in our translations, verse 6. It's about his zeal to persecute the church. He pressed into that. But of course, in ours, it's a picture of uh, not dragging, panting, and limping, but finishing well. How eagerly and diligently are we embracing discipleship, times in the word, fellowship and accountability with other believers, the means of grace. Even in COVID, not less, but more, pressing on. How enthused and empowered by Jesus in our thoughts and conversations and actions. Press on boldly. And I thought of an example, there are so many in our lives, and especially right here in Houghton. I thought of John and Carolyn Miller in that prison situation, captured in Vietnam in the late, uh, mid-1970s, and uh, nine months in the jungles, surviving, and how the Word of God, the Psalms, songs and hymns, helped them to press on triumphantly through that. And a wonderful book, you can see it in our church library, and maybe get it in the bookstore still, her book, Captured. It's an amazing example of pressing on. So that's the first little set of three words, press on, press on, press on. The second is, take hold for which Christ took hold of me, he says. It's fascinating. It's a phrase used three times in verses 12 and 13. Take hold. Get to know his purpose for you. Why did Jesus call you to be his person? As Anne mentioned, people also often ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? I guess I'm still working on it. But um, I want to just share that my sister Isla, who's actually kind of dangling right now between the present and the glorious future, even as we speak. In ninth grade, she was given, I remember that, a same assignment, writing a paper on what do you want to be when you grow up? And because she was in a pastor's home and many missionaries came, including Rebecca Bibby, a great missionary nurse and took care of uh, orphans in India. I remember her coming to our home. And missionary magazines, Isla determined in ninth grade that she was gonna be a missionary nurse. Followed that dream, came to Houghton College and started those two years of pre-nursing before she went to Columbia University Nursing School down in New York. But science courses were hard, and she was not doing so well, but she was taking art courses, and they were wonderful, and she was getting straight A's. I don't know why, but anyway. Um, and then came the dilemma. Do I follow the call, the thing for which God took a hold of me, or do I follow maybe the easy road? And she says she made a decision to go to nursing school. She succeeded, and very soon she was in Sierra Leone, the tropics, actually experiencing malaria and schistosomiasis and other diseases. But when she came back from there, basically because of health, she went back to Houghton College and got that art degree and began teaching and nursing at Houghton Academy. And there became an African student, one from Africa. And uh, he was struck with malaria and the doctors weren't, trying to f weren't able to figure it out. And she said, he has malaria. Get him to a hospital quick an ambulance to Rochester, and they found four out of five of the malaria strains in him, and in four days he was back at school. She shares that as a testimony. Take hold of what God takes hold of you. I say this especially for young people. Not the pressure of what parents put on you, the pressure of what you expect from this world, but let Jesus quietly counsel you, wonderful counselor, 
and show you what he wants out of you. And most of all, he wants a relationship with you. And then the second, or the third set of threes, and I've actually combined the two times it mentions prize and goal in verses 12 and 13. Who's the prize? Well, it's the Jesus we've just celebrated at Christmas, but the Jesus who also shared in his death and resurrection and his coming return. I think of Corinthians 15, where Paul says, what is the simple gospel? It's the same thing. I passed on to you what is first importance. Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried and raised the third day. I mean, that's basic Christianity, that's basic Christian orthodoxy. We sometimes get sidetracked. And I love what uh, G.K. Chesterton said, it is only since I have known orthodoxy or the basic simple Christianity that I have known mental emancipation. He went on to say, because this orthodoxy came embodied in the person of Christ, it also uh, bestowed on me an even greater gift, Chesterton says, joy. He says, joy, which was the small publicity of the pagan world, is the gigantic secret of the Christian. I love that. And it's Jesus, died, risen, and coming again. That's what we're going for. And uh, I've been reading with our banding group just recently through the book of Revelation. And you know, Revelation can give you problems with how do you interpret this or interpret that. But the one thing that stuck out to me as I was reading through it was the lamb, the lion, Jesus. And in our call to worship, the next verse was rejoice, rejoice. Jesus is the hero of the book of Revelation. And we as Christians, he's our prize. He's our prize. Make him your prize. There's another old hymn that we could have sung today, and you know it well. Fair are the meadows, fair are the woodlands. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is pure. He makes the sorrowing spirit sing. Fair is the sunshine, fair is the moonlight, and I'm skipping. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels of the sky. And I like the last verse, thinking of Revelation. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forever be thine. In a moment, we're going to close with a hymn that some have said is the most beautiful hymn in the English language. When you see it, you're going to say, yeah, a lot of these and thous and other things in this old, old hymn. They say it's maybe based on Bernard de Clairvaux's 12th century poem, Jesu Dulcis Memoria, one of the most beautiful poem, love poems for Jesus. And I think this is kind of a mellow sermon, but I'm hoping we fall in love with Jesus. I'd suggest an assignment for you is maybe take that hymn and try to paraphrase it in your own language, up to date, 20th century language. But the last verse says, Jesus, our only joy be thou, as thou our prize will be. Jesus, be thou our glory now and through eternity. There's those words, joy and prize. I know some are struggling with health, even life and death, but there is nothing but good and triumph ahead in our future if we have Jesus. And Jesus is close by to comfort and to love us. I want to go back to December 19th, right behind me here. There was a little boy with his head just sticking over the edge named Griffin Raymond. Do you remember his testimony? I don't know how old he is. I asked his mom for permission. But you remember his testimony? I believe in God. I believe Jesus died for my sins. He is the ultimate superhero. And down he went and came up. To me, that's what this sermon is about. He got it. Do you get it? Are you able to face 2022 and beyond? Face it with the prize, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that you mean and all that you are to us. 
It's hard in our world with all its noise and glamour and all its problems, but help us as Christians to know the joy of being yours and the joy of knowing you and the joy of serving you. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.